And so in life and death, Lord, abide with me. Shine through the gloom and point me to heaven's skies. I think that's how the song goes, something like that. God, help us to see you, we pray. Feels like we're cowering in the dark in a corner. And what is it that you're saying to us, Father? Help us to hear it. Help us to preach it. Help, it to be, help us to be it, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, it's good to see you. This is, am I real loud? I sound real loud. I sound real loud in my own head. Probably because there's a lot of empty space in there. But this is our fourth sermon from uh, the book of, of Romans, and it's a continuation of our last sermon from Romans chapter one that we titled The Dishonorable Passion. In Romans one, Paul told us that the wrath of God is revealed from heaven, wherever that is. The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all the ungodliness of men who imprison the truth within the chains of their own unrighteousness. And so God gave them up, us. Gave us up to our own dishonorable passions. So the wrath of God is to give us what we want. He gave them up, writes Paul, to idolatry, to confusing, much disputed homosexual activities that we talked about last time. Uh, covetousness, gossip, murder, strife, faithlessness, boasting, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, even disobedience to parents. Then he writes, Romans 2, verse 1, Therefore you have no excuse, O man, every one of you who judges. For in passing judgment on another, you damn yourself, because you, the judge, practice the very same things. Just by asking, what are these things? Have I done these things? Who does these things? You somehow do whatever is condemned in all these things. So you may think to yourself, well, I never murdered. I'm not a homosexual. I don't read People magazine, so I'm definitely not a gossip. But Paul is saying whatever is evil in reading People magazine, whatever is evil in any sexual encounter, homosexual or heterosexual, whatever is evil in the way anyone addresses their parents is an evil that you yourself have committed just by considering the people on the list. You, writes Paul, you practice the very same things. Last time we asked, well, what is that thing? What is that thing in all those things that we all practice? We, we ask, what is the dishonorable passion? I suggest that it must have something to do with this tree in the middle of this garden. And our passion, our passion for the knowledge of good and evil, isn't that what we seek every time that we attempt to judge? Without the knowledge of good and evil, it's kind of impossible to judge. In Jesus, wrote Paul, are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Now wouldn't that include the knowledge of good and, and evil? Jesus is the good in flesh hanging on that tree. Perhaps we take his life, the life, every time we sin. Every time we judge. Last time we noted that there are two desires represented in this picture. N number one, humanity's desire to take knowledge of the good. And number two, God's desire to make us good. Number one, humanity's passion, the dishonorable passion to take the life of the good and use it to make ourselves like God in the image of God. And number two, God's passion to give us his life and make us good. That's the passion of the Christ. Number one, humanity's judgment to crucify Christ, that's sin. And number two, God's judgment to give his life as a ransom for many, that's grace. That's a lot to think about, but Paul was a Jewish rabbi, and I'm convinced this was the dominant picture floating around in Paul's brain. To the Corinthians, he wrote, I have decided, I have chosen to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. This is original sin. And before that, original blessing. Romans chapter two, verse, verse one, 
You condemn, you damn yourself because you, the judge, practice the very same things. We know that the judgment of God rightly falls on those who practice such things. What is the judgment of God? Next verse. Do you suppose, O man, O Adam, you who judge those who practice such things and yet do them yourself, that you will escape the judgment of God? Yes, that is exactly what we suppose, right? We suppose that life is a zero-sum game. You keep score and you play to win. We suppose that God grades on a curve. In fact, we think that's probably the only way that we could ever possibly win. That's our only hope. We suppose that our neighbor's failure is our only success. So we're terrified to pass the ball. For the coach might think that the person we pass the ball to is a better player than us. Next verse. Or, or, Do you despise, the word should be translated despise, do you despise the riches of his kindness? Christates, also translated goodness. Do you despise the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance, his kindness? Jesus said this, listen, love your enemies and do good, and lend, expecting nothing in return, and your reward will be great. You will be sons of the Most High, for he is kind, he's good, he's kind, Christos, he's kind to the ungrateful and the evil. Be merciful as your heavenly Father is merciful. Do you despise, do you despise, as Paul, the riches of God's kindness? Yeah, of course we do. I mean, we're just like the older brother, right, who despises the father's kindness of the younger prodigal brother and so trades the party for the outer darkness. We're just like the early workers in the vineyard who despise the master's kindness of the late workers in the vineyard, and so they trade the vineyard for the wilderness. We're just like Jonah who despises God's kindness toward the Ninevites and so casts himself, he's a castaway, he casts himself outside the city where he weeps and gnashes his teeth. We think life is a zero-sum game that God grades on a curve so our neighbor's failure should be our success and most definitely not rewarded with kindness. We think that kindness is bad judgment. That's our judgment on kindness. Next verse. But because of your hard and non-repenting, impenitent hearts, you are storing up wrath for yourself on the day of wrath when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. Like I was asking, what is God's righteous judgment? And when is God's righteous, when is it revealed? Paul, Paul seems to think that we all despise it. And it seems that he's right. We threaten people with it. Judgment Day is coming. We even name horror movies after it. Some of my favorite, Terminator 2, Judgment Day. We despise it, we all want to escape from it, we even threaten people with it. Judgment Day is coming. So you better trust Jesus to save you from the judgment of God. Check out this uh, poster. Jesus saves, heaven or hell, Jesus saves, but after this, the judgment. So does Jesus save? Does he save us from the judgment of God? Our Father? What is the righteous judgment of God? In the Middle Ages, the church taught that we were justified by works according to all sorts of laws and rules and rituals like confession, penance, baptism, and communion. So at the end of time, God will judge our works and reward some of us for our works and others uh, he will punish. He'll reward some of us for our works with rest and he'll punish others of us with non-rest, more work. During the Reformation, Reformers thought that we're justified not by works of the law, but by faith. And then they taught that our faith must be evidenced by uh, works, of course. So at the end of time, God will judge our faith and reward some for their faith with a manifest reality of the kingdom of God. Followers of Joseph Arminius taught that faith was our free choice, but our free choice was not a work, although it would be manifest. 
as a work. Followers of Luther and Calvin taught that faith was not our free choice, but the free gift, the, the work of God's free choice, uh, so that no one could boast. Both taught that some would have faith and be rewarded with heaven, and some would lack faith and be punished with hell. Now, the followers of Arminius could blame hell on people because they chose hell, and they didn't choose heaven. They had bad judgment, which implies that their good judgment could have, could have saved them. The followers of Calvin couldn't blame hell on the bad judgment of people, so they had to blame hell on the good judgment of God. And so they said God chose some for eternal life through no merit of their own, and God chose some others for eternal damnation through no merit of their own, all to the glory of the righteous judgment of God. It's no wonder that we want to run from God's judgment. Because it sounds insane. And it's almost impossible to preach on God's judgment to evangelical American Christians because we are this weird mix of Roman Catholic, Arminian, and Calvinist believers who just claim a whole boatload of contradictory stuff, things, weirdness. And yet we all tend to agree that there are rules. God will judge. Some will win. Others will lose. And heaven is not having to do what God requires us to do on earth. So some think the reward for faith is to no longer need faith because you'll see God and the whole kingdom right there. Just like some think the reward for work is to no longer work. Because <laughs> isn't that what rest is, not working? Just like we all seem to think that the reward for righteousness, whatever it is, is that we will no longer have to be righteous. <laughs> <laughs> Yahoo! Game over! Game over! The reward for winning the game is to stop playing the game. And that's why we say things like this. You know, you should give your gold to the church. You should. So that you will have streets of gold in heaven. More gold than you'll know what to do with it. Or forgive your enemies now so you can refuse to forgive them forever. You can take vengeance on them as you sit at a great banquet and look on them and fry in a lake of fire as you eat broken bread and red wine and roast lamb. Delay your passion now so you can indulge it, you can indulge it, you can indulge it forever in heaven. We think righteousness is delayed gratification. But Jesus talks as if righteousness is an entirely new gratification. A, a new desire, a new mind, a new psyche, a new passion, a new judgment. Verse 5, you are storing up wrath for yourself on the day of wrath when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. He will render to each one according to his works. And that's terrifying, isn't it? Because Paul has already established that we're guilty. Every one of us is guilty of every bad work on his list. That's terrifying and confusing because as Martin Luther loved to point out in the next chapter, Paul writes, the works of the law, by works of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. So the things we do in obedience to a law don't justify us, don't make us right before God, and yet God will render to each of us according to the things we do do. He'll render according to our do-do. He'll re render what? What will he render? Next verse. To so those who by patience and well-doing, good doing, seek for glory and honor. That must be God's glory and honor, right? Not your own glory and honor. And, and immortality. He will give eternal life. That's the life of the age to come. It's not simply the same. Immortality and eternity aren't necessarily the same thing, but a different kind of life, the life of the age to come. But for those who are self-seeking, eretheia, it refers to someone who only works for a wage, like a day laborer. The self-seeking then don't care about the project that everyone is working on, they just care about their pay. They just want to justify themselves, not everything else and everyone else. They just want to glorify themselves, which is not glorious in the least. They just want to honor themselves, which is not honorable at all. They just want to hold the ball. 
which means they're going to lose the game or never play it at all. Verse 8, but for those who are self-seeking, eretheia, and do not obey the truth, remember the truth which is imprisoned in the chains of our own unrighteousness, imprisoned within us somehow, they don't obey the truth but obey unrighteousness, there will be wrath and fury. There will be tribulation and distress for every human being, literally every human psyche who does evil, the Jew first and also the Greek, but glory and honor and peace for everyone, every psyche who does good, the Jew first and also the Greek. And that's just pretty straightforward. So have you done evil? Just ask yourself that question. If the answer is yes, I want you to stand up. Go ahead. Todd's pointing at Georgia, so Georgia, stand up. Everybody who's done evil, just go ahead and stand up. Just go ahead and stand up. Now, look around. Just look around. There will be, according to Scripture, tribulation and distress for these people. Now sit down. Now, if you've ever done good, I want you to stand up. Now, I know, yeah, you stand up. You're here this morning. That's good. You did good. So stand up. Now, look around at these people and listen to the word of God. There will be glory and honor and peace given to these people. Glory, honor, and peace given to you. You can sit down. See, if we take Paul seriously, and I believe in taking the Bible seriously, if we take Paul seriously, we must all die. <laughs> that, my friends, is tribulation and distress. Don't know if you've ever noticed that. I'm not looking forward to that. And we must all rise, rise from the dead to the glory, and honor, and peace of God our Father. Jesus said, whoever would lose his psyche, <laughs> Translated soul or life or like being in this verse. Whoever, no, whoever would save his psyche, I'm sorry, he says whoever would save his psyche uh, or being or life or soul will lose it. But, but you see, everyone tries to save their psyche, right? And so what do we religious folks say? We say things like, don't you want to save your soul? Don't you? We can give you the knowledge of good and evil so you can save your soul from what? The judgment of God. That's not how people get saved. That's how we all got damned at a tree in a garden long ago. Jesus said whoever would save his soul will lose it. But whoever loses his soul for my sake and the gospels, the gospels will find it, lose and find his psyche. That's called repentance. It means getting a new mind, a new knower, a new psyche, a new soul, a new passion, a new judgment from a new judger. Verse 10, glory, honor, and peace for everyone who does good, the Jew first and also the Greek, for God shows no partiality. That shows no partiality. That is a nail in the coffin of five-point Calvinism. And also, I think a nail in the coffin of everything we've ever believed about the judgment of God. For not only does God reward some due to no merit of their own, I think Paul is going to make the argument that no one has any merit of their own. <laughs> to be rewarded. We didn't create ourselves. What a crazy idea. We didn't create ourselves, and so we cannot create ourselves, for what would we create ourselves with that wasn't already a gift of God's original blessing? God shows no partiality. Verse 12, for all who have sinned without the law will also perish without the law, be lost, destroyed, perished. And all who have sinned under the law will be judged by the law. For it is not the hearers of the law who are righteous before God, but the doers of the law who will be justified, literally made right and declared right. For when Gentiles who do not have the law by nature do what the law requires, they are a law to themselves, even though they do not have the law. They show that the work of the law is written literally in their hearts. What is the law? 
I mean, isn't it any knowledge of good and evil, isn't, isn't any law, the knowledge of good and evil, reduced to letters on a page? or written in stone so that we can take the knowledge and make our judgments? God gave his law to the Israelites on Mount Sinai, but every group of people all around the world have laws, whether they write them down or not. And that's because every person has the knowledge of good and evil in the secret garden sanctuary that is their own heart. So what's on the tree? in the garden of your own heart. Knowledge of the good? That's the good in flesh hanging on the tree in the middle of the garden, and that's the life (laughs) hanging on the tree in the middle of the garden. If, If you take the good to judge and so justify yourself, the life dies. But if God gives the good to judge and justify you, everything lives. Verse 15, they show that the work of the law is written in their hearts while their conscience, which can also be translated consciousness, while their consciousness also bears witness. You're like watching something. And their conflicting thoughts accuse or perhaps excuse them on that day when according to my gospel, my good news, that day when God judges the secrets of men by Jesus the Christ. So so what is the righteous judgment of God? Jesus or at least what God does with Jesus, which in some amazing, bizarre way includes what we do with Jesus. So what's hanging on the tree in the middle of the garden? Knowledge of the good, which is the life, who is the judgment of God. And when does God do this judging? Well, 2,000 years ago in the Garden of Calvary and at the beginning of time, your time, in the Garden of Eden and at the end of time in the Garden City of the New Jerusalem and right now, the moment that eternity touches time. Now is the judgment of this world, said Jesus. Now will the ruler of this world be cast out and when I am lifted up from the earth, speaking of his death and on the cross, on the tree, he said, I will draw all people unto myself. And now I have to tell you a story about judgment, my judgment. I'm a dad. And Jesus told us that God is our dad. And every good dad has a judgment. It's his passion. It's his deepest desire for himself and for his children. I issued this judgment on more than one occasion. Driving in our old blue van, for instance, on vacation while my four children bickered, whined, and complained in the back two seats about each other and the fact that no one cared about them. I might have even screamed out my judgment a a time or two in wrath and in anger. Damn it, kids! Now, I didn't damn them, but I damned the lack of fun in the van. Damn it, kids! Why can't we just... Have fun. Can we, can we just have some fun? My judgment was fun. But fun is a rather complicated judgment to issue, right? If you're a dad, you know that. My children are now 27, 30, 32, and 33. <laughs> so weird. But when they were two, seven, and eight, we lived in Golden in a house with an unfinished basement and the potential for like a whole lot of fun. The basement was our kingdom of fun. In the evenings, we'd go down the basement and play ball. Four square, soccer, football, whatever. It it didn't really matter. At that age, we didn't keep score, and there really were no rules. Except one, pass the ball. 
Well, it happened on several occasions. I'd be downstairs with John, Elizabeth, Becky, the three older ones, playing ball, having a ball. We'd be balling, as they, they say, when Coleman, who was two at the time, would hear the laughter and come down the stairs. He could see the fun, but he really didn't understand the fun. But he knew that he wanted to have fun. He wanted fun, too. And so someone, usually me, would pass the ball to to Coleman, pass the, passing the ball, and he'd just be thrilled with the ball because the ball is good. He'd be so thrilled with the ball, he'd run with the ball, creating the ball, and then holding the ball, he'd crouch in the corner so no one could take the ball. Then we'd all say, Coleman, hey Coleman, pass the ball. But Coleman would just hold the ball. Then I would issue my judgment. Coleman, buddy, you know, if you would just pass the ball, this would be a lot more fun. Sometimes when Coleman wouldn't pass the ball, we'd all just leave him there in the basement. <laughs> Hiding in the corner, in the dark, holding the ball. In other words, we would deliver him up to his own passionate desire to hold the ball. And within a few minutes, usually, Coleman would start yelling, Daddy, da Daddy, Daddy, John, Elizabeth, Liz Dick, Becky. Then he'd come up the stairs because he was lonely, afraid, and not having any fun. If you've ever held a ball for long, you've realized, well, this isn't fun. <laughs> this is just a piece of plastic. Sometimes when Coleman wouldn't pass the ball and we were tired of waiting, I'd just enforce my judgment. I'd go over to the corner, I'd say, sorry, buddy, I give it, and now I'm going to take it away because I'm bigger than him. And I'd just rip the ball right out of his hands and pass it to one of the kids so they could have fun. And there'd be tears and sorrow and anger for Coleman as he undoubtedly thought to himself, Dad hates me and he has no fun. But what he didn't realize was that my judgment is fun. Fun itself. So how could I get Coleman to pass the ball? What if I promised a reward and threatened with a punishment? Rewards and punishments appeal to our current desires and passions. So what could I say to two-year-old Coleman holding the ball? Hey, Coleman, buddy, if you pass the ball now, I'll let you hold the ball forever. In the basement, alone, in the dark. And if, if you don't pass, Coleman, if you don't pass the ball now, I'll take it from you. No, I'll give it back to you. So I can take it again, and then I'll give it back to you. And I'll take it again, and I'll give it back to you. I'll take it again, give it back to you. I'll take it again forever and ever and ever. We will pass the ball forever and ever and ever and ever. But you see, that's kind of a weird threat. Because that's the very good that Coleman saw and actually desired in the first place, though he did not understand it. All of us passing the ball. So... By appealing to his current passions with rewards and punishments, I'd teach him to fear heaven and lust for hell. And in that state, Coleman might pass the ball, but only in lust and fear. And it wouldn't be any fun. What would it be? Work but painful work, toil. It wouldn't be play. You know what play is? Think about it. It's work that happens to be fun because it's what you want to do. <laughs> it wouldn't be play. It would be gruesome toil. Toil is work that's no fun. It would be painful toil now and hell later. You know, volleyball on a tropical island sounds like a slice of heaven to me, but it can also be the, the pit of hell. Remember this scene? It's in the movie uh, Castaway with Tom Hanks. Uh, I'd love, I turned the sound down so that Facebook Live won't 
shut us down, but Tom Hanks is arguing with this volleyball named Wilson. He says, I'd rather take my chance out there on the ocean than spend one more day on this, he says it, shithole island talking to a goddamned volleyball. And then he decides to leave the island. (laughs) If you insist on holding the ball, God may let you hold the ball for a time. But it won't be heaven. It will be hell. Not God's judgment. Your judgment. The Father's judgment is fun. Fun itself. Fun itself. And that's why what the Father wants is faith. He wants faith. I want faith. I want Coleman to get sick of his own judgment and so surrender his judgment to my judgment just long enough to pass the ball because he wants to pass the ball. And when Coleman chooses to pass the ball, a miracle begins to happen. He sees Becky laugh. And then he watches John laugh. Then he watches Elizabeth laugh. And then I laugh as I pass the ball back to Coleman. And and he passes it to Becky, and we all laugh together. Not a little joy, but compound joy. Coleman repents. He loses himself in the game and then finds himself playing the game. He comprehends more than himself, for he's been comprehended by the game. And so now he passes the ball. Why? For the love of the game. He's no longer conscious of only Coleman. He's conscious of all of us. It's a higher consciousness called fun. By the time Coleman was in elementary school and then all all the way through high school, Coleman and I would stand in the street for hours just passing the ball back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, and it wasn't just plastic. It was fun. I submit to you that the Father's righteous judgment is fun. And so, of course, the thing that he desires is faith. So how does the Father create faith? Well, he keeps passing the ball. He may leave his children in the basement for a time, holding the ball. He may even rip the ball from their hands in anger from time to time. But faith happens when his children watch him pass the ball. Pass the ball, even at great expense to himself, so that his children see that he considers, he considers all the pain, all the pain to be worth the fun, the joy that is set before him. So what's the ball? Maybe this is the ball, the thing that's hanging on the tree. What is that thing? Well, that's the good. And the good in everything that's anything, it's the Word of God, by whom all things are created and sustained. Now, you may think, but Peter, all creation isn't just a cheap piece of plastic like a ball. Everything that's anything is not nothing, and that's true. And yet, if you think it all belongs to you, And so you only hold it to yourself? Perhaps everything that's anything becomes nothing to you. (laughs) So what's on the tree? Your house? Your car? Bottles of, of wine? All the money in the world. So do you hold the ball, or do you pass the ball? The thing on the tree is everything that's good, and it is the good. God alone is good, said Jesus. It's God that's hanging on that tree, God. Now you may think, but Peter, God is not a cheap piece of plastic, and that's true. But if you take him only for yourself, perhaps you make him, him who is everything, into a nothing to you and for you and in in you. In other words, you crucify the creator and you turn the life into death. 
The thing on the tree is the creator, all creation, and yourself. (laughs) Why? Well, because you are his creation. So if you hold the ball, that is yourself, he dies. Creation dies. And you die. You become a tomb that imprisons the truth, who is also the life. But if you die to yourself and surrender to the truth, you pass the ball and find yourself in the game, the infinite and eternal game called life, the one life that is the resurrected body of of Christ. So what's that on the tree? Well, that's the knowledge of good and evil who is the life, the manifest judgment of God, your Father. He is the revelation of love. Love is choosing to pass the ball. And life is everyone that loves, and the life of love is happy. (laughs) It is the judgment of God our Father. Fun! (laughs) So we're out of time. But I want to give you two quick words of advice, all right? Number one, if you want to understand Romans chapter 2 and the rest of the book of Romans, just read it with these things in mind. When you read judgment of God, think fun. When you read faithlessness, unrighteousness, or sin, think holding the ball. When you read love, righteousness, faith, or sacrifice, or grace, think passing the ball. When you read heaven, think of a bunch of little kids playing in a basement having a ball. And when you read hell, think of one child clutching a ball all to himself, all alone in the corner of that basement with heaven all around him, just waiting for him to join the fun. And when you read repentance, think of the kindness of our dad. Romans 2, 4, we read this question. Paul says, do you despise the riches of his kindness? Not knowing that his kindness is meant to lead you to repentance. And yet Paul didn't actually write that. Modern translators write that. They add that, or part of that. Paul didn't write his kindness is meant to lead you to repentance, as if God tries kindness, and then you know, when it doesn't work, he switches to not kindness. Even God's wrath is a function of his kindness. Is meant to, that phrase is meant to, is simply added by modern translators as if they despise kindness because they think it has no power. Paul actually wrote what the King James and all literal translations reflect. He wrote this. Don't you know that the kindness of God leads you to repentance? Like Jesus said, the Father is kind to the ungrateful and the evil, which means that one day even the ungrateful and the evil will have fun. He is that kind. Jesus does not save us from the judgment of God. Jesus is the judgment of God. But Jesus does save us from the wrath to come. Only because Jesus is the judgment of God within us right now, whenever we love. Jesus knows how to have fun. So it's no wonder that the tax collectors and sinners wanted to hang out with Jesus. And it's no wonder that religious folks wanted to take his life on a tree. We saw fun, but didn't understand the fun, and so jealous of fun, we took the life of fun. We took the ball from God the Father. That's original sin. But God the Father had forgiven the ball from the foundation of the world. That's the original and eternal blessing. The ball is an imperishable seed that dies and comes to life in you. It's more powerful than you can even begin to comprehend. So number one, sorry I said this would be quick. Remember the judgment of God is fun. And number two, if you want to have fun, because you know you're not having fun, don't just try to have fun. Because that will make everyone miserable. Instead, come and sit at the base of this tree. 
and say, Daddy, I'm not having fun. Am I um, somehow holding the ball? Bet you are. Might be your finances. Might be a bottle of wine. Might be him. Is he not working for you the way you want him to? Do you think you own him as if he's your own, your private possession? I bet you're holding the ball. It will certainly be yourself, your identity, your own righteousness, your pride, your your pride. It's your body, it's your, your flesh, your psyche, it's your life. Ask him, am I holding the ball? And then ask him, how could I choose to pass the ball? And then watch him pass the ball. He takes bread and he breaks it saying, this is my body given to you. And in the same manner, he takes the cup. He said, this is a covenant in my blood poured out for the forgiveness of sins. Drink of it, drink of it, drink of it, all of you. You know, if you just hold this to yourself, before long, I bet you'll think, I'm... Um, well, this isn't any fun. I think this is just a piece of bread and wine. But if you receive it as a gift, and so pass it to your neighbor, well, I think you might begin to realize, well, my goodness, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Your dishonorable passion is to hold the bottle, the ball. Your, your father's eternal passion is love. Love is life, and life is fun. This is the painful doorway to eternal fun. This is the judgment of your father. This is the kindness of God. Eat it, and then pass it to everyone. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs> So, Father, we thank you that from the foundation of the world, you have predestined your ch children to freely choose fun. God, uh, <laughs> I get so frustrated with you sometimes until I remember that you don't want me to hold the ball. So, God, um, forgive me because you know I'm a ball hog. And <laughs> I thank you that you have just this incredible ecstatic joy. Well, you are this incredible ecstatic joy, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and you have predestined us to join your party. <laughs> You're good. In Jesus' name, we see it and thank you. Amen. Amen. And so what I said there at the end, I'd encourage you. We'll, 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 we'll try to pick this up next week, okay, because Paul's going to go on to talk about religion, which is a thing that really will mess with you when you get into it. Um, but think about, think about uh, that picture, and maybe you could do this, because I've been doing that this, this week. This is, this is why God asked me to preach, so that maybe I'd listen once or twice. Um, but I've, in the morning, I'll try to just sit there and, and go, God, I'm not having fun. Um, am I holding the ball? Because there have been times in my life where it felt like I was holding the ball. You know what I mean? <laughs> it was pretty cool. And there are times when it felt like he's ripped it away. Times when it's felt like I'm sitting there in the dark and the ball's not fun anymore. And I think uh, if you do that, he'll probably say, yeah. Peter, you're awfully concerned about your own credit. Maybe you could give it away. <laughs> Maybe you're worried about dying. I think he'd say, well, one day you will need to <sighs> deliver up your spirit. And then I'm going to throw it right back at you. But ask him, am I holding the ball? 
And then I think uh, the shock is there's this incredible liberation on the other side. <laughs> I can have fun. In Jesus' name, may you believe the gospel and have fun. Amen. Amen.